170,000 US military personnel are deployed overseas. Of them, about 60,000 or 35% are stationed in Japan, more than any other country. In fact, only two, Germany and South Korea, even come close. And while this number has been slowly declining in most places, troop deployments in Japan are actually on the rise. Its islands are home to over 80 American bases, and the Navy's only forward-deployed aircraft carrier, USS Ronald Reagan. The US-Japan alliance is among the strongest in the world. In the last century, Japanese leaders have made more state, official, and official working visits to the US than any other ally. The public in both countries also overwhelmingly view the other favorably. 71% of Japanese and 87% of Americans. Yet there has always been a fundamental sense of imbalance. The United States is unquestionably Japan's closest ally. But Japan is only one of many close American allies. One needs the other for its continued existence, whereas the other only wants the benefit of cooperation. For being friends, the two countries exchange a whole lot of money, leading many to wonder, who gets the better deal? Sponsored by CuriosityStream and Nebula, where you can watch this bonus video about Japan's almost nuclear deterrence. The relationship between the US and Japan has never been normal. Unlike NATO allies who are committed to defending one another, theirs is one-sided. While the US is bound to protect Japan, which it accomplishes through its extended nuclear deterrence, the reverse is not true. Instead, the arrangement began as a strategic trade, security in exchange for bases, which gave the American military a front row seat in Asia. It was agreed that Japan would provide all the facilities, airfields, and ports, while the US would pay for everything else. At the time, all this seemed perfectly fair. Japan, after all, was then completely devastated by the war. In fact, it could very easily be argued that as the victor, the US took advantage. As time went on, however, Japan only got richer and richer. So too did the yen gain in value. The circumstances had changed dramatically, yet the deal had not. And so, under pressure from the Americans, in 1978 Japan began making payments above and beyond what was required by the treaty. Because these payments were designed to demonstrate understanding for the costs, monetary and otherwise, shouldered by the Americans, they became known as the sympathy budget. The US prefers the term host nation support. While making clear this was completely voluntary, Japan built new facilities, paid their utilities, and covered the salaries of its citizens who worked in them. Then, two things happened which raised concerns of loyalty. First, Japan refused to help secure the Persian Gulf during the Iran-Iraq War, despite being explicitly asked to do so by the US. And second, Toshiba was caught around the same time selling military technology to the Soviets. The country was at serious risk of being seen as a bad ally. It knew it had to do something. That something turned out to be formalizing the previously voluntary annual payments into contracts, called special measure agreements, to be renegotiated every five years. Japan's contributions climbed immediately to a new high. In the 40 years between 1978 and 2016, Japan paid something like $65 billion in total for US forces, with an average increase of 17% a year. In 2019, it contributed roughly $3.16 billion to the US military when everything from labor, to utilities, the cost to relocate training exercises away from civilian populations, and facility upgrades are included. But what do these numbers really mean, you may wonder? In 2017, Japanese politicians claimed the country shoulders 86% of the total cost to station US troops there. The Pentagon came up with 74% in 2004. 
other sources go as low as 50%. Whatever the true figure, it's higher than South Korea, around 40%, or Germany, 32. None of these numbers, however, are complete. Many contributions simply can't be quantified. These include things like indirect subsidies, the infrastructure around bases like roads, waived taxes and fees, and quite substantially, the rents that could have been collected from the land occupied by bases. Last but not least, Japan buys nearly all its defense equipment from the US. The biggest sacrifice made by the Japanese government, however, is not monetary, but political. Politicians are caught between two very powerful forces. On one side is the public, who overwhelmingly opposes militarization. Anything resembling an expansion of the military will be met with intense scrutiny. No party, no matter how popular, can afford to ignore the will of voters on this issue, which means very carefully tiptoeing around the entire subject of defense. In 2015, for instance, Shinzo Abe passed a security law allowing the military to protect its allies under certain circumstances, in addition to self-defense. A right so basic and universal that it's enshrined in the United Nations Charter. For this, he paid dearly, as you can clearly see in this graph of approval rating. On one day alone, 300 protests were staged across the country, the largest of which attracted 120,000 people. Shinzo Abe's relative success in politics came despite his perceived hawkishness, not because of it. In the run-up to elections, he would cleverly shift focus to the economy, only turning to defense after he had won. On the other side is the United States. In America, where no equivalent peace culture exists, Japan's unwillingness to expand the size and role of its military is not some noble commitment to pacifism, but somewhere between greedy and dangerous. Many would like for it to take on a greater share of the financial burden for the sake of fairness. Others, including much of the foreign policy establishment, see Japan as relying too heavily on the US at the expense of its own military and ultimately the security of the entire Asia-Pacific region. Thus, Japanese politicians must carefully balance these two forces, in the short term satisfying the demands of voters or else losing power, while simultaneously meeting the rising long-term expectations of its ally or else losing its sole source of protection. This tension came to a head during the first Gulf War. In December 1990, the US ambassador called the Japanese prime minister on the phone, asking a long-standing ally for support against the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. But doing so was deemed unconstitutional. In one poll, just one-third of respondents supported sending forces, though with one hilarious condition, that they not be armed. In the end, Japan refused. Only after a ceasefire was announced did it send six small, vintage wooden minesweeping ships. Even this was controversial back home. The international community was furious. Instead of sending forces, Japan contributed cash, $13 billion, or 20% of the total cost, though it stipulated the money could only be used for non-lethal purposes. Yet, with zero casualties to the US's over 100, it didn't sit right. Japan was accused of checkbook diplomacy, paying money to dodge its obligations rather than doing the noble thing and putting lives on the line. In truth, its assistance was far from necessary. The victory came easy. It wasn't about money or need, it was about fairness. Japanese politicians chose to obey the will of voters, who opposed the war but in doing so, lost a great deal of international credibility. But the lesson stuck. Ten years later, on September 11, 2001, it took the Japanese government just 45 minutes after the attack to set up a task force and declare its full support for the US. Within a month, Japan had passed an unprecedented law that would later allow boots on the ground in Iraq, despite popular opposition and protests. Since then, its troops have been sent to Cambodia, Mozambique, Rwanda, and a dozen other countries. 
But this is not quite what it seems. The government only managed to sell this dramatic shift in defense policy, at least by Japanese standards, by imposing insanely strict restrictions on itself. The law only permits deployments of up to 2,000 troops, only for UN peacekeeping operations, and only if five specific conditions are met. The Japanese self-defense forces are forbidden from infantry tasks, including doing things like collecting weapons, and can only operate in areas explicitly deemed safe. Japanese troops often require dedicated protection from troops of other nations, which is sometimes derisively labeled babysitting. They arrive only after bullets have stopped flying, leave at the earliest sign of trouble, and because they're forbidden from protecting allies are sometimes more a liability. None has ever died on a mission overseas, and a single death would instantly trigger a crisis back home. This solution, in other words, narrowly satisfies both parties, the public and the US, but only marginally. The trouble is that these two opposing forces continue growing further apart over time. Contrary to expectations, young Japanese, even without a visceral memory of the war, have not waned in their cultural inclination towards peace. Yet the American public, and by extension decision makers, increasingly demand more from its allies. And while accusations of unfairness reached a fever pitch during the Trump presidency, they are by no means new. Whoever the president and whatever the global circumstances, Japan faces the same basic dilemma. Public opposition prevents it from ever taking control of its own defense destiny. Yet, only one country can fill this hole, the United States. In short, Japan has one option, and one option only. Who wouldn't be anxious? If it were ever threatened with war, it would have no choice but to hope for protection by the US. That is, except for one very last resort, the nuclear option, if you will. In this bonus video, I explain how Japan could acquire nukes in a pinch. You can watch this and other entirely exclusive bonus videos on Nebula, the streaming platform built by and for creators. Some of my favorite recent Nebula originals are Legal Eagle's Bad Law Words Good and Second Thought's The New F Word. Best of all, you can get access to Nebula and Curiosity Stream, home to great documentaries on history, nature, and technology, like this one looking back at World War II, together for just 15 bucks a year. Sign up by clicking the link on screen now and get both Nebula and Curiosity Stream for this incredibly low price.